<laughs> it's sort of a weird shadow because it's dark out. But uh, anyway, everybody's here. Everybody can hear me okay. Everyone's got your books. <laughs> One, two, three. <laughs> Great. Okay. Great. And these um, Lama Yeshi Wisdom Archive books, these two, you used these a little bit last semester, is that right? Or did you, were, did you have a chance to look at them last semester with Venerable Amy? How things exist and virtue and reality, were there any sections that you already have looked at? No. Ah, okay. <laughs> so it will be exciting and fresh. So um, for this class, we're going to really be digging into emptiness from a lot of different perspectives. And because of that, it's really useful to do a prayer like the Heart Sutra, because one, it kind of reinforces the whole point of the semester. But two, it's very powerful in dispelling obstacles and confusion. It's got very powerful wisdom merit. So we're going to do the Heart Sutra um, before every class, and on Mondays we're going to do it in English, and on Wednesdays we'll do it in Hebrew. So we'll start with the Heart Sutra, and I'll do share screen. So don't worry, you don't have to go hunt for it or anything. And uh, here we go. And if you, have, if you feel comfortable to try to recite along, um, it can help familiarize. So just see how you go, but um, it's useful if you can say it out loud, because it'll help reinforce the concepts. So in the bold, I prostrate to the Arya Triple Gem. Thus did I hear at one time. The Bhagawan was dwelling on Mass of Vulture's Mountain in Rajagriya, together with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagawan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avlokiteshvara looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then through the power of Buddha, the Venerable Shariputra said this to the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avlokiteshvara. How should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? He said that, and the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avlokiteshvara said this to the Venerable Shariputra. Shariputra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom should look upon it like this correctly and repeatedly beholding those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Form is empty, emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form. Form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors and consciousness are empty. Shariputra, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness without characteristic unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra, therefore in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind. No visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object of touch, and no phenomena. There is no eye element, and so on, up to and including no mind element, and no mental consciousness element. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, and so on, up to and including no aging and death, and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation, and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non-attainment. Shariputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom, the mind without obscuration and without fear. Having completely passed beyond error, they reach the end point of nirvana. 
All the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifestly, completely awaken to unsurpassable, perfect, complete enlightenment in reliance on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequaled, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering should be known as truth since it is not false. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared. Taya ta, om gate gate, para gate, para sam gate, bodhisattva. Shariputra, the bodhisattva, mahasattva, should train in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagawan arose from that concentration and commanded the bodhisattva, mahasattva, Arya Avalokiteshvara, saying, Well said, well said, son of the lineage, it is like that, it is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom, just as you have indicated. Even the Tathagatas rejoice. The Bhagawan, having thus spoken, the Venerable Sharivati Putra, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara, and those surrounding in their entirety, along with the world of gods, humans, asuras, and gandavas, were overjoyed and highly praised that spoken by the Bhagawan. just think what what meaning do you get from the very famous line form is empty emptiness is form emptiness is not other than form form is not other than emptiness just based on your studies so far your own logic and your own life experience what does it seem like that's saying form is empty Emptiness is form. And how would thinking in this way help prevent negative states of mind and harmful actions How would thinking in this way increase wisdom, empathy, connection? Just think analytically for a moment. Okay. So we'll keep coming back to that prayer, which has so many layers. Um, but hopefully there was a few little sections that sort of felt familiar, things that we've talked about in the past. There is a reference to the five aggregates. There's a reference to the Four Noble Truths. There's a reference to the 12 links of dependent arising. Uh, relative truth and ultimate truth. So it's it's a very interesting text to penetrate because a lot of what you already know is in there. It just takes a little bit of time to draw it out and see where it's indicated. Um, if you're wanting to, to jump <laughs> to the end and understand the Heart Sutra from the very beginning, there's a book called Essence of the Heart Sutra by His Holiness the Dalai Lama. So if you need a sneak peek because you're impatient and want to know what it all means immediately, that can be a side project. But basically, we've, we normally teach from the most subtle, the highest view of emptiness and dependent arising. And then once you're used to this highest, most subtle view, which is presented here in the Heart Sutra, then we go back to the beginning and we start to look at the coarser views. So it's an interesting approach. And it's what we're gonna be doing this semester is really looking at identity and reality from many layers. And the reason we do this is that not everyone is ready to think that the self is completely empty of inherent existence and there's no permanent core thing that freaks them out. And it also might not resonate with their experience either. And so we kind of go to these coarser levels and examine them from the perspective of logic and life experience and see that kind of coarser or lower tenants 
actually are very close to our everyday experience of who is the self and who is others. And if we can kind of get into their worldview, which is still way more subtle than our normal worldview, you know, we pretend to be at the subtlest view because that's how we've been taught. But in terms of how we actually act in the world, we probably are not on board with that. We're full of duality and divisiveness. So if we could actually go into these lower schools view, it would still be subtler than where we actually are. And then we can incrementally work our way up to the highest view, which is presented in the Heart Sutra and which is what we normally speak from. So it's an interesting um, approach. And I think it's very relevant to your work because I think a lot of suffering and conflict comes about because of misunderstandings about who is the self, who am I, who are others, and what do we owe one another because of that, you know, and what is the social contract that we all agree on, and then when we don't agree on it, what is the truth of what is necessary in terms of ethics, in terms of responsibility, in terms of loyalty, you know, these are all the meat of a lot of conflict is different opinions about what those things are. So if you can get to identity, then it becomes a much more interesting process rather than arguing about everyone should do this or no one should do that. It becomes much more about the interconnection of things and then acting in a harmful way just doesn't make sense anymore. Rather than feeling like you need to, I don't know, change fundamentally behaviors in order to become a more compassionate, altruistic person, becoming a compassionate, altruistic person becomes the only rational response because you finally understand self-relationship to others in an accurate way. Does it make sense? So there there's a lot of conversation around identity in pop culture there's a lot of conversation around identity i'm sure in your work but we're kind of using our self as the guinea pig you know the who am i question and if you're very good at going through layers and layers and layers of who am i and coming to find that there is no one driving the bus <laughs> that becomes very useful to bring to really any relationship that you have. And it can kind of invite that wisdom out of other people because part of us kind of knows that our identity is not as solid as we make it out to be. So if you're not overly identified with your characteristics, you're safer to be with. You're less defensive, you're less aggressive, you're less competitive. And, you know, certainly some aspects of the world would say, oh, no, you'll lose all of your ambition. And we would say, good. <laughs> what has it led to? The destruction of the earth, right? The destruction of relationships, families, etc. You know, if we all just kind of settle down a bit and let go of our competitiveness, life could be a lot happier. So it's just something interesting to explore. But before we kind of dive into it, I want to figure out where you guys um, are at in terms of the content. So when you were with Venerable Amy, did you discuss relative truth and ultimate truth? What's your understanding of those two? It doesn't have to be technical or precise or anything, but just kind of like, what does it mean to you, relative truth and ultimate truth? Just throw some words out, even if it's not perfect. Maybe the relative is more deceptive. Yep. In, in what way do you think? That it uh, depends on our uh, senses. Uh, and so it's, it's not the real uh, reality. It's what yeah, mean. that's going in the right direction. Yep. Yeah, yep. M yeah, more about the relative. Yeah, you're, you're on the right track for sure. That it's the more deceptive truth. Merely labeled? Yeah, yeah, convention, merely labeled. Yeah, and that's quite subtle relative truth, but still relative truth. Yeah, exactly. Um, what, yeah, what's the illusion of relative truth? Or what's the lie of relative truth? 
how do things seem as opposed to how they actually are? Things seem uh, solid and permanent while they are impermanent and not solid, etc. Yep, 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 exactly, exactly. More, more, this is all true. <laughs> Mikaya. No, I said it, they, they, they seem inherently existing. Yes, yes, exactly. They seem inherently existing when the opposite is true. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, it's interesting, right? So what's ultimate truth in a nutshell? Or not in a nutshell. Out of a nutshell is fine too. What is ultimate truth? It's, it's connected to the emptiness. Yes. Yes. Could you even say ultimate truth is emptiness? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So, so you had some conversations about that. Is there, were there parts where you were kind of stuck on what is the distinction or some ideas that you wanted to go into? Well, for me and Tim. Yeah. I'm happy to see you. Yeah. And, uh, to see you again. For me, it's very um, it's challenging to grasp grasp both of them in both time in the same time. Like sometimes I can have glimpse of, but it's hard for me. I guess it's practice, right? To put it inside everyday life. Like it's very challenging to hold them both. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> for sure. For sure. And it's kind of like, you have to do it in the abstract, or in terms of memory, in quiet moments, reflectively by yourself. And then that, that old wisdom, that old knowledge that you have about past events and past relationships, starts to come closer and closer to the present. Until you're so used to this idea that you don't get hooked by the same old dramas that you used to get hooked by. There still are dramas, there still is conflict, there still is all sorts of dynamic, interesting things in life, but you're not like captivated in the way that you're believing everything 100% without any space. You know, this example that we, we always give of like, when you're watching a movie that's very, very, intriguing and you're really interested in the movie and you're absorbed in it you can be doing that in a way where you can still be interrupted and not become upset by that as opposed to when you're really invested in a movie or a novel and if someone interrupts you you're mad you know you're like too far in do you know that like difference where you've like, you've sunken into the story and now you are like one with the story. And part of you even wants that state. You know, you want to be completely absorbed in the story, even if the story is tragic. <laughs> even if the story is horrible and violent, still you somehow want to be sucked into it. And if someone says, oh, telephone call, you're like, shut up, shut up, <laughs> you know? And that's kind of the way we're living our life is completely believing the story without any space to see it's just a drama unfolding. There's a way to be very engaged without being so attached. And actually if we're engaged but detached, we'll be more effective and suffer less and cause less trouble, you know? Yeah. Jonathan, when you yeah. say emptiness, what, what are the images that come up? What we're talking about an absence, right? We're talking about a negation. So something that isn't. And what we're trying to say is everything is empty of what? It's empty of this inherence which is kind of what we're believing all the time. And if we don't believe it all the time, what is left, it's not like there's nothing left. It's like there's everything left instead of this like tiny keyhole that we've been looking through our whole life. You know, it's like there's this amazing landscape of reality, huge landscape of reality. And we've just been looking through this tiny little hole and thinking that's all of reality. And we like draw a border around it 
and say, this part is significant here within this tiny window. And there's this great vast reality that we miss out on. So by grasping at inherent existence, we paralyze creativity and we like suffocate movement, you know, and we become stuck in our negative habits. So with, with emptiness, everything is possible. If you don't understand emptiness, things can't change in the way that you want them to change. They'll keep changing because things are impermanent, but it won't feel so self-directed. You'll feel much more a victim of circumstance. Yeah, whereas if you're acknowledging the fact that everything is lacking this self-creating quality, then you start to ask, well, then what does create things? And you start to see that everything is a coming together and then a label on top of. And what you're choosing to kind of group isn't a self-grouped thing. Yeah, so, so we use this analogy a lot of like the letter A, you know, before you understood English, it was just three lines, right? It's not inherently existent an A, otherwise you would know it before you were introduced. So before you were introduced, it was three lines and a line that went across. And then someone said, when you see those three lines, think A, and it makes an ah sound. And it took you a while and eventually through repetition, you remembered. And now when you see an A, it jumps off of the page at you, telling you that it's an A. Almost as if there's, it's it got its own power of A-ness, right? That's the way it seems. When in fact, what you're doing is putting A there where those lines are. There is no A there, right, from its own side. We're the ones saying it's an A on those lines. But there are still lines there. So it doesn't matter with A's, right? It matters with people. And if you say this, this, and this quality equals a good person, and this, this, and this quality equals a bad person, then you make it so, and you're just yelling in an echo chamber or just kind of talking to your own projections and never seeing possibility. And yet there's a practical aspect of noticing patterns and of forming habits based on seeing certain characteristics. And that's why this is such an interesting topic because you know, you're not saying ethics don't matter and you're not saying patterns don't exist. And you're not saying if I'm alone in a dark alley in a busy city that I shouldn't be a little bit alert because the crime rate goes up after dark. It's not like that's not true, but you're not thinking it's true in and of itself, divorced from context. So, so part of you already knows this. This isn't even Buddhism, right? This is just common sense that we often forget but there's levels and levels of depth to it, which is why we study what's called tenets, philosophical tenets. And it's basically looking at levels of understanding how much is actually there. You know, is there a tiny bit of something that inherently exists, but mostly everything doesn't? Or does nothing inherently exist whatsoever? And what is inherent anyway? So these are the conversations we're gonna be having. But in order to even want to have them, you have to ask, what's the problem <laughs> with not having them? You know, what's the problem in our life? Not understanding reality accurately and not understanding the self accurately. Yonten, um, yeah. can I ask something um, about the emptiness um, meditation that we practice, that we need to think of the I of the self uh, de de of the self declaring I, and then try to find where is this uh, where is this I, and one thing that uh, Amy um, said a lot is that it has to be found in uh, one place. I mean. Is it here or is it, it cannot be uh, composed of uh, more than... When you're look, yeah, when you're looking for the fake one. Yeah, when you're looking for yeah. the pretender. Yeah, it's that sense of solidness. So yeah. uh, 
why why is it not valid uh, to find an eye that is composed of uh, more than one part? Because because that one is not the troublemaker, right? The troublemaker is the one that seems solid, permanent, unchanging self existence. That's the one that doesn't exist at all. There is a self, but it's not that one. So you have to find the feeling that that one does exist very much so. So when we're sitting calmly talking, it doesn't feel like you have an inherently existent eye. It feels like you're a collection of conditions and experiences and genetics and whatever, right? And food, I don't know. Like you're a collection of stuff and whatever, no problem, right? It kind of, you know, you don't feel so solid if you're not feeling triggered. But as soon as someone says to you, you are amazing. <laughs> you either say, yes, I am, or no, I'm not, but something reacts, right? When you have something react, that's the illusion self. That's the false self. So you try and remember a time in this meditation where the self felt very solid and real, and you use an example in your life of when you were like praised or criticized or in danger. You know, like when you're about to fall down the stairs and you grab the railing and you're like, <gasps> almost fell down the stairs. The eye feels very solid. And so you take that as your example of, I do believe this illusion. Let's see how it's illusory. Yeah. So, so you have to like conjure it up because we don't notice how much it's the one that's operating all the time. Just this false self, the facade. This is what's being kind of projected at the world. And then when people don't believe it, we're upset. You know, this is who I am, this mask in front of me. And that's not the self at all, not even relatively. The relative self is that which is merely labeled on the collection of parts. So relatively, no problem. Merely labeled on the collection of parts, that self conventionally exists, no problem. Ultimately, completely empty of inherent existence, right? So that's the reality of things, right? There's the conventional self and the ultimate self. We don't know either one of those. What we know is a whole other level of projection, which says, I am, in this kind of like finite way. It's the part of you that feels like you're sort of the same person you were when you were five years old but you've just become more sophisticated and educated over time. But you sort of think the same way you did when you were five years old. There's part of us that kind of feels that's true. When in fact, when you see a five-year-old child, you go, no, my thoughts are very different <laughs> than when I was five years old. There's a continuity. There's, you know, there's a continuity of consciousness, but there's not a hardcore thing in the center that has never changed despite it feeling that way, which is a great relief. But at first it's very confronting because then who are you? Yeah. yeah. I I did, maybe I didn't understand. You said that the, uh, the relative self is uh, merely labeled of, on collections of parts? Yeah, the aggregates. Ah, okay. Yeah, the, the parts are the aggregates, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, not random parts. <laughs> yeah, or you could say merely labeled on the body and mind, but the body is made of parts and the mind is made of parts. And then you could say, okay, the mind, this, the primary consciousness, no, but the primary consciousness is also made of parts. So there's no fundamental partless part in the self, is there? And yet it kind of feels like there's a little core that adds experience or takes away habits or, you know, kind of gets built up on top of. And so these examinations, they're very confronting because you start to feel a little unstable and it's not a conversation to have with someone who is very unstable. You know, it's a conversation to have with yourself when you're feeling pretty grounded. When you know who you are, then you can tear it apart. If you don't know who you are yet, it's too soon for this inner work. It's destabilizing. 
This is advanced practice, even though intellectually we can do it, unless you're feeling pretty grounded, it's not a good idea to do this. You know, and I'm sure you can understand why that would be. <laughs> and you probably can think of clients in your life who really should not have this conversation. They need to really find themselves first and ground themselves first. You don't want to start picking at the edges of that because they don't have enough stability yet. What is tenet? Is it's a kind of school? Tenants are like beliefs, ah. logically held beliefs. And there's levels of these logically held beliefs and they're called philosophical tenant schools. And there's four of them and that's what our semester is gonna start touching into. And we're gonna come back to the subtlest view but it's kind of like worth opening up the different ideas about identity and realizing even within Buddhism, the Buddha himself taught different levels of identity to suit different ways of thinking and different personalities of people. So we always teach this one way because it's easier, otherwise people get confused. But now that you've kind of generally got where we're going, we can go back and look at some of the coarser views, which are actually are closer to our everyday lived experience. You know, so you could do like an even coarser one, which would be, all right, so who are you? You just sit there and reflect, who am I? What do I identify as? You know, and you think what, your nationality or something or your gender or your economic status or your level of intelligence or your hunger level? <laughs> I don't know, I am hungry. You know, I am sleepy. I am a girl, <laughs> you know, whatever. But so you just pick something that feels very much like I am, okay? So you think, okay, I am American. Based on what, <laughs> right? What if I found out my mom actually gave birth to me in Canada? Oh my gosh, my identity, you know, like I would be happy actually, but you know what I mean? Um, so, you, you know, that's a very surface level, but even something so surface has an effect even though you know it's just this facade, it's just pretend, borders are nonsense, you know? And yet, just that idea of, oh my gosh, what if I was Canadian? What does that mean about me? It's like, it doesn't mean anything unless I decide it does, you know? Like, what if you did some genetic testing and you found out that none of your ancestors were Jewish? You know, what if you did some genetic testing or you did some, um, I don't know, scanning and you realized that you had different chromosomes than you thought you did and you were actually technically the other gender even though you looked like the one that you thought you were. You know, what if you realized suddenly that you were a millionaire because someone gave you a whole bunch of money in their will? You know, all of these very surface things already start to rattle your sense of reality, right? And that's the course. That's not even getting something. into tenants, right? Hmm. It means something. Uh, all the uh, all this belief, and maybe maybe it's relative, but it means something. If I that's am the point, uh, right? That's the point. Is even this I very am. coarse level means yeah. something? Imagine going more subtle. Hmm. Right. Okay. That's the whole point. Is that as soon as you identify as something very strongly. What does that mean? Something else is other. And as soon as there's other, there's competitiveness, there's conflict, there's distrust, there's isolation, there's alienation. If you hold your identity features lightly, as they're just merely labeled, then there can be some flexibility and fluidness and your heart doesn't close when you meet other. You know, so like, so think about something like nationality and, you know, like if I was very, very identified as American, that would create more conflict in my life, don't you think? <laughs> Whereas if I say I'm merely labeled American based on where I was given birth, then I can acknowledge some traits that our communication style has in common and I can acknowledge some ways of viewing things that we seem to have in common, but it's just some traits and not even all of us have them. And if some people don't like some or do like others, it doesn't have to say anything about me. I have nothing to defend. But if it's concretely me, then I have to defend it. And I feel under threat. Do you know? 
And that's surface, right? That's not even getting into tenants. So it's useful work, right? Yeah, you're right. Can I ask because, you know, when you use the example of I'm American or Israeli, I can throw it away in a minute, like my, uh, this kind of identity. Okay, it's a uh, pretty, oh, sure. I'm not very attached to it. Maybe some of you, are, some of us is, are more attached to their Jewish, Jewish part or something, but there are some identities which are much more on much more holding, grasping. Um, so. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. And so like you have to keep digging till you find the one that actually starts to trigger you. It doesn't even matter which one it is, you know, so you just keep picking away at it. And it might even just be, I exist, <laughs> you know, as an independent entity separate from other existent entities you know, I am my thoughts, like go deeper, right? Never mind nationality, never mind gender, never mind all of that. What about I am my thoughts? I own my thoughts. I create my thoughts. They're mine. No, they're not. <laughs> all by myself? Did I make all these thoughts all by myself? Did you make all your thoughts all by yourself? You know, it feels like you did but all of your thoughts are a coming together of influences that arrived here. If a different person was talking right now, you would be having a different series of responses. And yet, you know, it's not like I gave you your thoughts, no. Right, all of your life experiences up until this point, meeting these sounds, meeting whatever background sounds are in your life, meeting whatever happened earlier today is influencing what you're thinking right now. So they're yours nominally, but not, they're not from you inherently. But that's confronting, right? It's like, what do you mean? <laughs> do I have, you know, free will? Do I have control? Like, and yet it can actually help free you up in a lot of ways. To just kind of let go of identification with anything. So then you can be taking responsibility without attributing qualities or faults to the identity. You can just think, oh, that's not a useful thought. I'm going to adjust it. That is a useful thought. I'm going to increase it. Instead of thinking good thought means I'm a good person. <laughs> bad thought means I'm a bad person and make it so concrete and overly simplistic. But I'm sure you have clients who maybe have some weird obsessive thoughts about something and think that they're terrible people because of their thoughts, right? And you think, well, they have their thoughts because of many conditions coming together. They didn't make them all by themselves. And you have all sorts of compassion for them thinking, of course, given your childhood, given your conditioning, given this, given that, of course you have these kind of thoughts. And you're just listening to them going, oh, if they could only, see what I see, you know, that they are not to blame for these thoughts, that they are not their thoughts. And yet, can we do that with ourselves? You know, can we do that with ourselves if we're having brilliant thoughts, you know, about all sorts of amazing ideas and we're coming to new conclusions and then we share it. What if someone steals our idea? It was never ours, <laughs> you know, it was a coming together. And yet, is it useful to have intellectual property laws? Perhaps, you know, this is the razor's edge that we're walking on, is that ethics still apply even in the absence of inherent existence. And that is the middle way. And that's why it's very delicate because it's easy to say, oh, if everything's merely labeled by the mind, then I can label anything as anything. And you go crazy, right? You can see how you can kind of like go too far with it. But so far, we're not going far enough. And, uh, what? Yeah. Um, I'm also happy to see you again. <laughs> um, in these uh, topics, always something that makes me confuse a little bit is that our continuum 
our subtle the consciousness is still different than others continuing. Even yes. though it's empty, uh, it's still uh, our continuum, or it's not our, but it's still different continuum than another one. In that respect, there is a, a, some kind of, it's not stability, but a specific continuum. So, and, and this is in, in the absolute, in the, uh, in the most, uh, most uh, gentle uh, aspects, I think. In the most subtle relative, in the most subtle relative, ultimately mind itself is empty of inherent existence. But, you know, it, that becomes a complex conversation. But if you can imagine consciousness like a string, maybe, and that everyone else has a string and then all of these strings intersect in a kind of an infinite network. If you pull one string, it ripples through and has an effect on this string over here. So it's like they're two different strings, but they're directly influencing each other. Yeah, so it's kind of like we all have different consciousnesses, but they're all of a similar quality and they're all completely interconnected like a big net. You know, and so what influences one part influences another. And the choices one part makes are influenced by the choices of the other. But you can still say, here's a knot right here and we'll call it your name. You know, but it's kind of arbitrarily, we'll call it your name. We could, you know, draw a circle around anything and say, we shall call it this. You know, like sometimes it's easy to imagine it like numbers, right? If you had numbers one through 10 written out in front of you just numbers, and then you colored all of the prime numbers blue, suddenly an image would appear. But if you decided, I will now color all of the even numbers green, a different image would appear. You know, it's like there was no image in and of itself, but we chose to isolate certain components and then something jumps back out at us. And so if it gets too abstract, we have to just think about I think we have to think about what is our everyday difficulties in life and how do we make this self the main character of everything, which means it's always getting celebrated or some tragedy and how that does not help us live a happy life or an effective life if we're always the hero or the victim, you know? If we're the hero or the victim, we're, we're the main character, whether we're happy or we're suffering. Whereas if we're kind of seeing this interconnectedness, you, you lighten up, you know, like your life is not such a big deal. It's still really important, but it's important in the grand scheme of how is it impacting everyone else, you know? And, and I guess just, you know, you use examples from your life to prove this, days that you've been self-absorbed are more suffering days than days that you've been altruistic. You know, really altruistic days, genuinely working for others without being the savior, without being the martyr, but just genuinely expansively benefiting others. You're happy with very little extra effort on, I need to make this one happy. But if you're by yourself all day, deciding I need to be happy today. I need to relax. I have a day off. Here's a day for me. It's me time. <laughs> Sometimes those days are the most kind of, I don't know, melancholy. Sometimes they're indulgent and fun and nice, but often days that you're self-absorbed are actually suffering days. So, you know, make it practical and like lived to prove it to yourself. Yeah. You notice how children get when they're like not sharing their toys they're not happy not sharing. They're like, this is my truck, <laughs> you know? And they're like very aggressive about the mindness of it. But when they're sharing, there's kind of like the peaceful kingdom, you know? And everybody is just kind of playing with toys and sharing toys and like everybody is happy in that kind of gentle, deep contentment rather than what seems like happiness, that possessiveness where you say it's mine. You have kind of like a, kind of a happiness, but it's kind of an aggressive, agitated, excited happiness that usually crashes and goes into depression or anger. 
Right. So, so just kind of like using real life examples to touch the truth of how believing this illusory self hurts us and it makes us harder to be with and less compassionate to others. So, um, so I just wanted to look at one of our texts for a second. Um, the, let's see, it's in the, this one, um, the green one, page 93 but I'll put it on the screen if you don't have it easy, but on page 93, we're talking about the here, the name of the book, how things exist, the green one. On page 93, it says wrong conventional truth. So we're not even talking about ultimate truth. We're talking about two different kinds of conventional truth. So Lama Zopa Rinpoche says, the mind of a worldly being, someone who hasn't realized emptiness, can discriminate between correct conventional truth and wrong conventional truth. However, the mind of a worldly being can't recognize the object to be refuted, that things appear to exist from their own side are hallucinations. Okay, so what it's saying here is that for us, we can have two different kinds of relative consciousness. One that is in accord with reality, like worldly, re worldly convention, and one that isn't, you know? So I can say, this is a book, that's a worldly convention. And you'll all say, sure, yes, it's a book. But if I say, this is an elephant, because I can merely label by the mind, this is an elephant. You'll say, no, that's a wrong convention, right? So when we're talking about accuracy, there is worldly convention at the basis of things that make things a valid basis to label on. So we're going to kind of unpack that idea further, but if you want to just kind of look at that section um, after class and just kind of have a think about it, that can be really useful. So just to kind of review, relative truth or conventional truth is deceptive because it holds to inherent existence. Ultimate truth is emptiness, the fact that things lack inherence. Okay, so just kind of get really clear on those two terms because it's going to keep coming up again and again. And then the different tenant schools have different opinions about what those two mean. So if you have a general idea, it's much easier to have the continuing conversation. Yeah. So today's just kind of like getting used to the words. And then on Wednesday, we have a pre recorded class that um, Karina is going to facilitate. So right now we're just going to um, go ahead and dedicate and we're going to use something conventional because we started with something ultimate. May all beings everywhere, plagued by sufferings of body and mind, obtain an ocean of happiness and joy by virtue of my merits. May no living creature suffer, commit evil, or ever fall ill. May no one be afraid or belittled with a mind weighed down by depression. May the blind see forms and the deaf hear sounds. May those whose bodies are worn with toil be restored on finding repose. May the naked find clothing, the hungry find food. May the thirsty find water and delicious drinks. May the poor find wealth, those weak with sorrow find joy. May the forlorn find hope, constant happiness and prosperity. May there be timely rains and bountiful harvests May all medicines be effective and wholesome prayers bear fruit. May all who are sick and ill quickly be freed from their ailments. Whatever diseases there are, may they never occur again. May the frightened cease to be afraid and those bound be freed. May the powerless find power and may people think of benefiting each other. For as long as space remains, for as long as sentient beings remain, until then may I too remain to dispel the sufferings of the world. I'm just sitting with that. And um, before we finish this session, um, I just wanted to check in with you guys. Can you just kind of throw out kind of the main things that stuck with you from last semester, whether they were interesting or they were confusing? doesn't matter which one, but just kind of throw out <laughs> what are the things that stuck with you from last semester? And it's okay to think for a second if it's not on the top of your head. Shine. Shine, you talked a lot about Shine. 
Yeah. Did you do the nine stages of mental abidance and the yeah, five faults and the eight antidotes and the elephant and monk and rabbit picture? No, no, no picture. <laughs> but you talked about um, developing twelve abiding. links. Twelve links. You did twelve links. Okay, good. Yeah. Did you get stuck on any of the links? All of them? No. <laughs> so mostly you did Shine and 12 links and then a little bit relative truth, ultimate truth? Yes. We can go again, everything, uh, Yunten. <laughs> <laughs> so complicated. That... Yeah, yeah, it can be. It can be. Um, tell me what you feel was the main point in studying the 12 links. What do you think is the main point in that particular topic? Mm -hmm. What's its purpose? And it's not a quiz. I'm, I'm genuinely curious what you think. I guess it's a way to dissect, how do you say, to analyze, dissect, mom, to, to cut moment by moment to understand the um so it's not just as it look like but it's a series of uh, cognitions and senses that uh, um, at the end it looks like a book but it's a actually a process of uh, mm. yeah. it's, it's about uh, the in uh, it's inevitable uh, uh, it seems inevitable the moment that uh, uh, the mind or you know is coming into samsara then it, it I'm there is no stopping at no point at, at any of there's no stopping things. it what do you mean what are we doing then <laughs> for me I this is why 12 things for me is a very difficult topic because I don't see where we can inter uh, interfere there or, or change something because one thing leads to another in a way that I don't know where where we can. Uh, okay, how to break the wheel, right? How to break the wheel. You mm -hmm. break the wheel by realizing emptiness directly. So uh, that's why we study tenants. But uh, you also break the wheel by recognizing the window of opportunity between feeling and reaction. Yeah, so feeling then goes to craving, grasping, becoming, birth, old age, sickness, and death, right? Like that. But if you can just feel pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, without it turning into attachment, indifference, and anger, if you use that window to change habits, you also start to break the wheel. Even before you realize emptiness, you start to kind of ruin its momentum. So that's an important key point. So maybe we'll, we'll go back and just do a, a 12 links day just to kind of review. But the main point of studying the 12 links is to develop renunciation for samsara right, to decide that samsara is pointless and we want out of it so that we can benefit others more effectively. And there's a few junctures in the wheel where we can really like mess it up. <laughs> and thank goodness. It will be very beneficial if we can uh, hear you talk about it in, in, in with this, um, the Gesh, anyone? Topic? With this angle of okay, where we yeah. can, yes. where yeah. we, yeah. Okay. Yeah, they're directly related t subjects, so don't worry. But yeah, I was curious how much you guys got into that. And um, yeah, yeah, more more feedback from last semester, stuff that was really interesting or really confusing or any any other bits you want to make sure we kind of touch back into before we go into new material? We had a retreat uh, about uh, uh, happiness and generosity as, as uh, antidotes. Uh, to uh, negative states of mind and it was uh, very inspirational and uh, it carried me through a period but now uh, the elections are coming here soon <laughs> so everything is ruined for me I need to work up uh, positivity again because future is gloom here yeah 
I'm glad the retreat was good though. <laughs> That's good. But it had a certain, yeah, it, it carried a certain time, yeah. Yeah, anybody else? And you can email me too if something occurs to you. Um, but um, I didn't want to just kind of like move on if there were things that you guys wanted to go back to, if they were interesting to you. If it wasn't interesting or applicable to your work, it's okay, we can just move on. But if there were bits that you were like, oh, more on that, um, send me a little note. And, um, and you know, you can also send me a, a WhatsApp voice message if you feel embarrassed about typing in English, some people feel embarrassed. I don't care if your grammar is perfect, I don't care. But if it's easier for you to just send me a, a voice message, that's fine too. So, okay, so I'll see you guys um, next Monday, but on Wednesday, I have already made you a class and Karina will um, facilitate that. So you have a nice little class all ready to go. So I'll see you later. Okay, bye.